boy saw a report in a Swiss newspaper. It was an account of two London buses which were visiting Switzerland. And Carl and Hans decided to find out all about it. The person most likely to know was the attendant of the big British exhibition that was open down the road. Made in England, it was called. And sure enough, he did. Two ordinary London buses had been sent off on a big continental tour through France, Switzerland, Germany and Denmark to Sweden. Hans and Carl decided at once that however many official receptions were waiting for the buses, they were going to be the first to say hello. They searched the town for suitable badges of office. In the end, they settled for Union Jacks and two lucky Swiss dolls. Off they went down the road that leads to the boundaries of the city and arrived just as the buses came into sight. Whatever the unofficial reception may have lacked in dignity, it made up for in enthusiasm. That was how it came about that the first Swiss passengers to be carried by the London buses were two schoolboys who were taking a very roundabout route to school. In England, we don't get so excited about our buses. Those gleaming red London double-deckers, we take them rather for granted. But they feel differently about them abroad. And it's not surprising. Look at these continental buses, never more than one story high. That accounts for all the measuring that had to take place when our buses arrived. Length, breadth, height, weight, turning distance, fuel consumption, Vital statistics of every kind. All the time this was happening, the buses were bearing proudly their headboards, London to Zurich. But when they started work in the town, they dropped their long distance labels and became what they were at home, to number 11. There's something rather special about a number 11 bus to Londoners. It's the Sights of London bus, which passes half the famous buildings in town. Westminster Abbey, Big Ben, the Horse Guards, Nelson's Column, Trafalgar Square, St Paul's Cathedral. It's a wonderful way to see London, to go on the top of a bus all the way from Hammersmith Broadway to Liverpool Street. to see Zurich too. And all the Swiss passengers wanted to travel upstairs. After all, you can travel downstairs in a single decker any day of the week. And this was something special. Filled to bursting, the two London buses were on duty from morning till night. Their job, so far away from home, was to take people from all parts of Zurich to the Made in England exhibition and there was always a queue for the next trip. Soon the streets of Zurich, with their long, unfamiliar names, became almost as well known to the drivers as the Houses of Parliament and St. Martin's in the Fields. Only now it was hills and bridges and broad views of the lake instead of an occasional glimpse of the Thames. The time in Zurich slipped by and soon it was time for the exhibition and the number 11s to move on. When the sad day came to say goodbye, the unofficial reception committee of two were inconsolable. They wandered sadly around the exhibition, looking for a promised souvenir. After all, what else? And so the two buses were escorted out of Zurich, just as they'd been escorted in, by Hans and Karl. 
who was dearest ambition from now on may not have been to be a bus driver, but was certainly to go to London as soon as they could and ride on the top of a scarlet double-decker to their heart's content. Goodbye. Goodbye to Zurich and off into the lovely Swiss countryside. Before very long, they came to a bridge, which at first sight looked as if it might scrape the paint off their roofs. But no, the Swiss are a very precise nation. And needless to say, all that measuring had been very accurately done. Over the hills and far away, to the highest town in all Europe, St. Gallen, with the beautiful baroque facade of the monastery of St. Gallen Spitzen. And then to lovely Lucerne, famous as a holiday resort and full of English visitors, to whom a London bus is perhaps not the one thing they needed to make their holiday complete. Too much like a reminder of work. Perhaps that was why most of the passengers in Lucerne were the Swiss themselves, gay in their holiday national costumes, singing their national songs. After Lucerne, the next main place on the route was Geneva. On the way came the one and only casualty, a branch of a tree which refused to conform to the height regulations and dented the roof instead. En route for Geneva, they passed through Bern, federal capital and seat of the Swiss government. And then into the country again. This must be the first time a number 11 bus has passed a load of hay. Bowling along the Route Suisse and over the Pont du Mont Blanc, beside the biggest lake in Switzerland, which the Genovese call the Lake of Geneva, but the rest of the country call Lake Le Mans. Geneva is a great hostess to the world. Here is the Palais des Nations, where the League of Nations was founded, and the United Nations now sometimes sits, looking out to the lake over green lawns. And just opposite is Geneva's famous fountain, greatest single jet of water in the world. Geneva is almost like a little island of Switzerland, entirely surrounded by France. But further north, at Baal, which is also called Basel, we get into German-speaking Switzerland again. For we're crossing the Rhine, and this is the German border. Customs officials, police, regulations, and like all VIPs, the number 11 buses are proceeding under escort. some places, it seems to be just as well. Open country once more. The mild Teutonic landscape of southern Germany. But what's this? It looks very familiar. Auto stop, it's called. But that's only another word for hitchhike. It's the same gesture and the same idea in any language, anywhere. And though it seems to work very well here, we don't advise it for London buses when they're at home, going about their daily business. They seem to be having the old height trouble again. Goodness only knows what happens if the buses won't go under, because it's an awful long way round.
And now what? Lost? Not quite, perhaps. But it can't often happen that a passenger can show a London bus driver the way. Well into Germany now, traveling northwards, and soon here in Heidelberg. Romantic old Heidelberg, a university city full of tram lines and American soldiers now, but still with a student prince atmosphere, a prisoner of Zender feeling, with the old Schloss looking out over the town from a craggy Wagnerian height. For Germany is the land of music. Brahms, Weber, Richard Strauss. It's also the land of German sausages, apple strudel and sauerkraut. But for two London buses and their drivers, it's more likely to be remembered as the land of autobahns. Great double track roads that wind over the hills of Bavaria like white ribbon, leading straight to the north. It isn't all open roads, of course. Little cobble-streeted towns appear every so often, usually just off the main roads, like Einbeck, famous for its delicious, cool German beer. These splendid 19th-century gates have a Wagnerian quality, too, as if they might be leading to Valhalla. But no, it's the road into Hamburg, great port of the river Elbe. Hamburg is not only full of ships and cranes and warehouses, but it's full of opera houses and nightclubs too, where everyone, whether they're working hard or playing hard, is determined to get 60 seconds out of every minute. Up here in the north, the two London buses came across some pretty bad weather. It poured with rain, the wind blew, the trees smacked at the windows of the bus, and water flooded the streets. But let's face it, London buses are fairly well used to this sort of thing. Heading for Denmark now, Kiel. And this was where the hitchhiker left the bus. She may not know it, but she must have had the longest London bus ride on record. Another border. This is the land of Hans Andersen, where even the traffic stops for a feathered family, and almost any duckling may turn out to be a swan. Soon the rich, quiet, fertile fields of Denmark are rolling past the bus windows. Denmark is a land not only of agriculture, but of water, of ferries, swing bridges and boats. Incidentally, the London bus we're watching makes a daily journey to Liverpool Street Station, and the boat train for Denmark leaves from Liverpool Street to catch the steamer. So perhaps these buses don't feel quite so strange after all, except maybe when they find themselves in the middle of a horse market. Wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen. Venice of the North, sung about by Danny Kay. And these are the Tivoli Gardens, dancing away all through the night, while on a rock, looking out over the harbor, sits Hans Andersen's Little Mermaid. Ferries again. This time it's a long way, leaving Denmark behind and heading east across the Baltic to Sweden. The buses are reduced to the status of mere passengers. And here's a chance for the drivers to sample the famous Scandinavian open sandwich. And after lunch, they can relax. Getting near to the end of the journey now. A 
And just as the last drive is due, comes bath time. A lot of wind has whipped at those windscreens between here and London, and a lot of mud collected on those mud guards. For a positively final appearance, the triumphal entry at the end of the journey, London buses must be fit for a queen to see. It's nice to know that other countries have their traffic problems too. Reminds us of the Tower Bridge. Malmo at last. The end of the trip. And what should there be in Malmo to welcome the buses but a Scottish pipe band? London buses being welcomed in Sweden with music from Scotland. And so that was the end of the journey. And now it's time to say goodbye. new friendships, a lot of goodwill, a lot of fuel, and a lot of places. Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and, you've guessed it, home again. <laughs>